Hey, we're now looking at testing and we're going to throw in some stuff about good primary practice as well. So testing as a kind of formal stage can be either iterative or final slash terminal, depending on what you want to call it. So iterative testing is when you do it in stages as you're kind of going through the implementation process. So you code a few functions, test them, code a few functions, test them, but you're not testing it specifically after you've finished all the code, which is what either final or terminal testing is, where you actually do a formal testing stage after you finish all the code. Clearly the purpose of testing is to find errors and determine any vulnerabilities and then of course patch them, fix them. And clearly when you're coding, you're doing this all the time to an extent, you're constantly running your code to see if it works. But this is a much more formal way of going about it. You're doing a formal testing stage where you're systematically testing all the possibilities that could cause damage to your program. Defensive programming is a kind of um, popular term for essentially good programming practices to avoid errors happening in the first place. And so really everyone should be kind of following these pointers. So you should be anticipating misuse all the time you're actually coding and plan for all contingencies so all possibilities you want to have considered when you're programming so anticipating misuse means you expect a user to be malicious or at the very least ignorant of how to use your program you want it not to break by them um, misusing it so you perform things like validation uh, or sanitation as we look at in a second and so as a branch back to testing, when you actually write your tests, you want to do it for all possibilities. And the whole idea of defensive programming is to produce robust code, i.e. code that's difficult to break. You want your code to um, be able to handle any issues that arise when it's run, and clearly this will um, improve your testing phase. So an error is just an occurrence of an unexpected result, and there are three subcategories of error we're going to look at, first of which um, is the logical errors. So these occur when the program's execution appears to run as normal, so the execution seems to work okay, but not as you intended. So you want your code to do one thing, and in fact it hasn't happened, something else has happened, but the code does work. So due to that very nature, logical errors are the hardest type of error to detect and fix, because they occur due to a mistake some way. You've wanted something to happen, but actually you've made a mistake, your logic doesn't make sense, hence the name, and so you don't necessarily realize why uh, it's gone wrong so it can be hard to find. There are loads of examples but um, one might be some not really understanding how zero indexing works or they might just think it starts counting from zero so they're trying to assign the fifth element of an array to a variable and they've used five as the index number but this works but not as it should because the sixth element is being stored in this case because with zero indexing we're starting to count from zero which you might not necessarily realize unless you'd explicitly learn that. A second category as you're probably very familiar with because your ID will flag them all the time and these are syntax errors. And so syntax as a generic term is the collection of rules that form a language's structure. So it's not just programming languages, this is just general languages as well. So therefore a syntax error is when you break these rules and this happens all the time. As good a programmer as you are you're constantly going to have syntax errors whereas better programmers will have less logic errors than uh, inexperienced programmers. Loads of examples. A common one will be leaving off a semicolon or a colon in this case in Python and the language doesn't recognise this because it's not a correct statement. The final category are the most unspecific ones and are difficult to give examples for. So runtime errors just occur whenever you're executing your program. So um, Synax errors are during, uh, I suppose, technically logic errors are as well during the compilation whereas runtime errors are when you're actually you know, executing your code. So uh, because it's so generic, anything could cause an error, uh, a runtime error. It's difficult to pin down, but examples you might want to give are being no more memory left when you're trying to run your program, so you've run out of space in your RAM, or you've written some code that the computer can't compute. Like if you run an infinite loop, eventually it's going to cause an error so that it crashes and that'd be a runtime error. Going back to testing in particular, we talked about how you need to plan for all contingencies and anticipate misuse from your users. So clearly if you're going to simulate users, you need to include both valid and invalid inputs. Are you valid being you expect you want this to be interacting with your program, invalid being it, sh it would normally cause some damage unless you've programmed defensively. There are three categories of test data we normally talk about. First of all, normal um, test data, which is self-explanatory, just normal uh, data you'd expect to use to input if they were using it correctly. Boundary test data is a bit borderline, oh normal is also called typical by the way, boundary test data is a bit borderline, it could potentially cause some issues. For example, if you're using dates, the 29th of February might um, cause some issues unless you explicitly 
write some code that handles it because you're not you're not used to using between like February, but it can in theory happen. It could be someone's birthday, for example. So a bit of special care needs to happen, and you need to test it uh, to make sure that what you've written does work. And finally, error nest data is deliberately um, invalid. I it shouldn't really be able to work with program, but it should be handled. It should be designed so that the program's robust enough to deal with it. So it, going with this example, just a date that doesn't exist, like the thirtieth of February, never happens. So you shouldn't let it be stored in the database, for example. Test plans are something you might have had to do for your controlled assessment. And a test plan is just a document that outlines the requirements that need to be tested. So usually. In industry, for example, you've been given a specification document that tells you what you're meant to be doing, what your final produced code is meant to do, and it'll have a set of requirements. And again, this is a very formal document, not very fun to write, uh, or neither are test plans. So it's all very formal, it's very systematic, and test plan will correspond to all the requirements specified by your boss, essentially. So the test plan will give details like the test data being used and any expected results and actual results. So a test plan can often be, or part of a test plan can be a table, and there's no set uh, convention as to what columns you should include. These are examples of columns that are usually going to be there, or similar co columns, but you can't really go wrong um, if you roughly follow this. So first of all, you will specify the code that is going to be tested, maybe the line number of the code or the name of the function. You'll then state the purpose of the test, so ensuring the validation works with erroneous input for example, and then you actually um, specify the test data being supplied for the test and what you expect to happen. And the following two, and then if you have a column for the actual result and whether it passes or fail, you obviously leave this blank until the actual testing phase. So you might write your test plans ahead of time, say during implementation or even before that when you're actually first planning out the design of your program. Trace tables are a favoured exam question topic for examiners and they're used to test for logic errors. So what they are, they basically record values stored at different points of a program, usually of variables or arrays sometimes as well. So here's an example of first a logic error and how you would maybe find it using a trace table. So we've got some code here, a numbers array and we've got a sum and an average and we've got a pretty pointless <laughs> bit of code that finds the sum and then finds the average. Um, so it, it's using each index to find the sum. And there's a better way of doing this, but this is the first example I could think of. So the average of this group of numbers should be 8. Uh, presumably this adds up to 40. Uh, but when you get it, you get an average of 6. So this is the logic error. The code works, but not as we expected. So we can do a trace table, and generally your columns will be the names of whatever you're keeping track of, your variables, or in this case an array. You can see we've got our indexes here and our actual values. So we do it step by step, and there's no... You can, uh, yeah, it's difficult to explain exactly, but we'll do it step by step. So the first step is just kind of the initialization bit where you're putting all your values in. Sum is initially zero, as is average, and our array is each index is these values. So the next step is to enter this loop. An x starts off as being one, and then two, three, four, so it increments as we go through the loop, as you'd expect. And so at the first iteration, the sum becomes 7, and in the second iteration it becomes 11, 19, 30, and so on. And then at the final step, as it exits the loop, because it exceeds the range for x, the average is found and this is 6, and nothing else changes at that point. So hopefully you can see how it's kind of step by step, and there are always going to be gaps in the trace table. Some people are desperate to fill in all the gaps, and that's pointless, you don't need to. So we can see where the issue arises, because 10 isn't actually being added. You want this code is meant to add every element in this array to the sum variable, but it's not doing it. It's skipped out 10. 10 is our first item of the array, but it's, not, it's jumped straight to 7. And so the logic error is that we've basically our range in our loop is 1 to 5 when it should be 0 to 5. So the logic error is the, the range hasn't been fully understood, so it's not produced the output we want. In a simple example like this, trace tables will be done by hand, as will they be in the exam if you get a question on it, but IDEs can generate trace tables for you. Going back to defensive programming events, talk about validation. This is just checking data meets a set of criteria before you process it. So you don't really want to, again going back to anticipating issues, you don't want to interact with any user data before you validate it to check that it meets whatever criteria you want. And this could be things like it has a certain length, like it would do in a password, but it's got to be not null or it's got to be within a certain range. Validation is similar to authentication. You'd implement both with loops, so keep looping till correct data is entered. 
But authentication is adding more context for data, like a set of usernames or a set of passwords you want to authenticate before you allow them to access your system. Validation is just making sure the data works with any code that follows it, so it's not going to cause any issues later. This code is validation because we're just looping while the password's null. It's not going to let you enter a password that's null, i.e. empty. Whereas this code here is a bit, bit more contextualized because we've got an actual password, we're matching it to an actual string. So this is a, a much more specific, this is just checking it in a general sense, this is a much more specific matching. Sanitization is not a very common term, but it is important to do sometimes, depending on the context. This is actually modifying an input to make it valid. Validation is just checking the input is valid, this is actually forcing it to be valid in a way. So if we had, for example, a text file name as our input, and it has some gaps in it, sometimes gaps can cause some issues with code, so you might want to sanitize it by putting an escape character in to tell the program that this is meant to be a gap as opposed to you know, three separate commands potentially, or you put it in strings in another way. But we're sanitizing it and making it valid so it won't cause any issues down the line. Then you might validate it. So sanitization is often done before validation and might validate it to make sure that it's a text file, for example, that could be one of the conditions. So it checks that the last four characters are dot txt. So two separate steps. Sanitization is making sure it works with the code. Validation is also doing that, but only checking it matches a set of criteria. Certainly, as I've used it, sanitization involves escaping potentially dangerous characters, often with backslashes or quotes around them. So for example, a semicolon could signal the end of a injection statement, which will cause some damage. So it is very important to do. Let's end by looking at ways we can improve readability and maintainability in code. So readability is how easily code can be understood and maintainability is how down the line you can, I guess, understand your code. So they are very related. First of all, comments. Comments are just annotations that exist alongside the active code, the code that actually gets executed. Comments are only there for humans to read when we're looking at source code, not for the compiler. So comments should be used to explain what you are intending to do if you're working on a project or if you've finished a project in the case of maintainability, what is actually doing. So it's related to the fact that if someone looked at your code, a comment will help them understand what's going on, both now and in the future. Descriptive identifiers are really important. Identifiers being the words used to label variables or constants or functions. It's very difficult to fix code if they've been given stupid names. It's very helpful if they are descriptive, i.e. a count variable is called count, not dog, or whatever. So it makes it a lot easier to keep track of what's happening. And it's important to keep these uh, names identifiers consistent when you're programming. Indentation is really important too. In some languages it's part of the syntax, like Python, but other languages are freeform, where the white space doesn't matter. You don't have to indent at all. Indent is just a space at the beginning of a line. But even if your language doesn't require indentation, it can show nesting really effectively. And nesting is where you embed a control structure within another control structure. So you've got, say, a while statement that's got if statements within it, or an if statement that's got other if statements within it. So you've got layers of nesting. And you don't have to show it, you could just show it as a, a big paragraph of code, but it helps to kind of indent each layer. It's very clear which unit is which. So yeah, this is an example of indentation and nesting. So we've got a for loop inside an if statement. So a lot easier to look at, a lot easier to isolate a layer of nesting if you need to for testing. It makes it so much easier if you indent your code.